welcome to LINK 2022. Today we're going to discuss uh, distal embolization and I have with me uh, Paul Bogal and Dalen Bemen uh, to speak about uh, this concept. So first, can you tell us what do you uh, think about or how would you define distal embolization? So I think uh, personally distal embolization uh, and new embolization to new territories are two slightly different concepts and they represent uh, slightly different problems that we need to uh, manage. Distal embolization is relatively straightforward if you have an M1 occlusion and at the end of your first pass or at the end of the procedure you have a let's say an M3. This to me is distal embolization. Embolization to a new territory is let's say loss of some clot from an M1 into the ACA territory. Now. Probably this is something that we haven't really investigated very well, but a recent paper by um, Satoshi Tatashima's group demonstrated that actually each of these appears to be occurring in approximately 10 to 20 percent of cases. So it's actually quite common and probably an overlooked problem, at least to a degree. So Daniel, in your opinion or in your experience, uh, how much this can affect the outcome, the good outcome of our patients? That's obviously depending on the amount of thrombus that you lose somewhere. Um, but as you can see in all the studies we did, I mean, with, even with the best techniques, we now do like what 60 something percent ticky 3 first pass. So that does mean that around 40 percent of cases will have distal emboli clearly affecting that. And if you go down to ticky grades of 2B or even less, then you have a significantly worse outcome for the patient. So um, it's an important issue and it's always a good question because there might be distal emboli that you then can attack and um, treat. So for those patients who might have a bigger chance of having a good outcome, but you usually do have quite a lot that are so far distal out that you can't treat them mechanically. And uh, for those patients, it's, it's definitely affecting the clinics. So in my opinion, uh, the steps, the crucial steps in, in which we can break the clot and create some distal embolizations is uh, first when you, when you cross the clot with your microcatheter, then when you drag it with your stent retriever through multiple curves, you can have this rollout roll phenomenon. And finally, when you ingest uh, your clot inside the aspiration catheter or the base catheter, you can have this shaving effect. You can strip the clot. Or do you think, Paul, there are certain specific occlusion locations or, or conditions that may favor this, this, uh, this concept? Yeah, so I think this is a, a very interesting question and we have to remember that this is a dynamic problem because obviously if you have a PCOM, you have ACOMs, the flow changes that are occurring during the pull and during the procedure are actually changing. And so when you cover the PCOM, you may not have uh, retro, uh, retrograde to anterograde flow, posterior to anterior, et cetera, et cetera. So these are things that are occurring dynamically, which we don't often think about. So for me, obviously, you need to develop techniques, a technique to rule them all, let's say, that will limit um, uh, these sorts of issues and having to work stuff out in the procedure to continually alter what you're doing. The one that I fear the most, actually, is a, a T occlusion because I've seen this happen and it can be an unpleasant affair to be stuck with, where the T occlusion, you've got most of the clot out on the first pass, but at the same time, you end up with a A2 occlusion and then a distal M1 occlusion. And in that scenario, you potentially have taken a relatively good state and made it a lot worse. So Daniel, with the tools we have today, do you think uh, there are enough or what are you doing? How do you use uh, the present tools that we have uh, to minimize this, this phenomenon? I think in my mind the concept is that we usually have the position that is proximal to the clot and we have a position that is somehow distal to the clot. And what we can do and what we do and what is very effective is control proximally. So we have balloon guides avoiding the flow while we retrieve. But what we can't do right now is having control for the distal uh, part of where the clot is because that's where we usually lose the emboli to. So currently I would say balloon guide is one thing that's probably the most important to avoid emboli. And Paul, what about the concept of microfiltration that we can uh, create uh, at the tip of the stent retrievers? So I think this is a very uh, novel concept and I think it's a very good idea. Um, trying to minimize uh, even these tiny little clots that we 
you know, and geographically can't see. And certainly some of the studies coming out like um, Choice are demonstrating that this micro uh, thrombus that is probably uh, attacking the whole brain is causing a, a problem. So if, for example, we can have a microfiltration net at the end of a uh, stent retriever, we can control, as Daniel says, the distal, distal problem, the distal ra rather than just the proximal problem. And maybe, maybe we still have to give some TPA or tenecteplase, but maybe we can lower the dose overall required to still boost those outcomes and hence maybe reduce the rates of sitch and things that would be associated with intra-arterial drugs. So Daniel, would you, would you be willing to, uh, to use or, or uh, this, uh, this, uh, these nets this, uh, at the tip of, of, the, of the stent retrievers? Definitely, I think the idea is actually what we're currently missing. It's a tool that will enable us to somehow control a distal um, position to the clot. And um, yeah, we have to see how, the, how good that works, but based on the technology and the idea behind it, I think microfiltration can be a good way to reduce distal emboli. Okay, thank you guys. It was uh, great to discuss with you <laughs> this, this topic. Hopefully we'll have uh, new tools to, to deal with, with this uh, complication soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.